Right. So if you've taken linear algebra, then 3.1 should be one of the earliest types of problems that you do, uh, where you're starting to learn about vector spaces and basically proving or disproving whether or not a given set of vectors belongs to an actual vector space or not. So uh, we are given the definition of what a vector space is from section 8.1, and I'm going to copy that right now, actually. Uh, basically, 8.1 is just the definition of what a vector space actually is. Uh, it's something that's super common. You learn it everywhere. Uh, oh my god, I just stretched it into something horrible. Give me a second. Okay, so this is as big as I can make it, unfortunately, but that's okay. I believe this is still okay, so I'm going to read it out. Uh, basically, a vector space consists of a set of vectors, alpha, beta, gamma, etc., etc., together with a set of scalars, a, b, c, etc., etc., which is closed under two operations, vector addition and scalar multiplication. Um, so I'm not going to elaborate on exactly what this means because this is a very basic thing that you should know, assuming that you have taken linear algebra, uh, but there is one important thing to note here, which is that we are saying together with a set of scalars. So in traditional linear algebra, you're working with real vectors. So your set of scalars is considered real. Uh, in contrast here, because of the fact that we're dealing with quantum mechanics and imaginaries are now a thing, the set of scalars is no longer just the set of all real integers. Um, and if you look at here, there's like a little subnote one. And if you actually have the textbook and read this subnote at the bottom of Appendix A, uh, what you'll find is that Griffiths basically mentions like, oh yeah, in this case, because of the fact that our Schrodinger equation deals with complex terms, uh, and because of the fact that the wave function itself is a complex thing, if you want to represent it as a vector, you're going to need complex vectors. Uh, so Hilbert space, by definition, is also a complex vector space. It can accommodate vectors that have imaginary terms inside of them. Uh, and because of that, the set of scalars is no longer real scalars, is now the set of all possible imaginary scalars. So A plus B I. And now we have to prove uh, that the space is still valid under two operations, vector addition and scalar multiplication. So uh, let's start with vector addition. So vector addition. So let's say I'm given a vector uh, f, or in this case, a function f, because uh, in this case, we want functions, not vectors. Uh, so if I have a function f that is in Hilbert space, it is square integrable and does not evaluate to infinity. So I'm saying that a the integral from a to b of the magnitude squared of f dx is equal to some constant c that is not infinity. I also have that the integral from a to b of my second arbitrary uh, function g, which is also in Hilbert's case, uh, is equal to d. So what I'm saying is that c and d are both less than infinity. Now, uh, what I want to do is I want to prove that this is valid under vector addition, or in this case, function addition, I suppose. So if I instead take a new vector or a new function and define it as y is equal to f plus g, then my question is, is the integral from a to b of the magnitude squared of y still less than infinity? If this is true, then we have proven that the set is closed under ve vector addition, because this implies that this addition of f and g is still in Hilbert space. So let's do that. Uh, the integral from a to b of the magnitude squared of f plus g. So this is f plus g star multiplied by f plus g. Take the actual complex uh, conjugate and we get f star plus g star multiplied by f plus g. Then we just use distributive property and this is f star f plus f star g plus g star f plus g star g dx. And then we just use traditional addition rule for integrals and split this into four different integrals. This is the integral from a to b of f star f dx plus the integral from a to b of f star g dx plus the integral from a to b of g star f 
dx plus the integral from a to b of g star g dx. Now immediately you should see that this is the integral of magnitude f squared dx and this is the integral of magnitude g squared dx. So automatically this is equal to c, this is equal to d. These are both constants, uh, they are less than infinity, so if you add them together that sum will also be finite. Now if you look at these, this is really just the inner product of f with g, and this is the inner product of g with f, as defined by our definition back in 3.1. From the Schwartz inequality, uh, we know, that. so we haven't proven the Schwartz inequality yet, but we know from the Schwartz inequality, which was given to us in 3.1, if f and g are both in Hilbert space, which they are because we are assuming that their square integrals in this region are finite, then their inner products must also be finite. So this is some finite number, which I'll call like A, and this is some finite number, which I'll call B. So ultimately, your final, the square integral, uh, uh, or the magnitude squared integral of F plus G is equal to four constants added together. And since all of these four things are finite values, the final result is also going to be finite. C plus A plus B plus D is going to be less than infinity. And therefore, this implies that the inner product between f and g, or sorry, not yet, I'm going too far ahead. This implies that uh, our Hilbert space, which is the set of all square integrable functions, uh, not set, sets space, is closed under vector addition. So we have met one of our two required conditions. We have met closed under vector addition. The next thing we need to close it under is scalar multiplication. So now let's do scalar multiplication. So in this case, I have my square integrable function f such that the integral of the magnitude of f squared in my given region of interest is equal to some constant c, where c is less than infinity. And then I have an arbitrary scalar, which I'm going to call a plus bi, because remember, since we're working in a complex vector space now, our scalars also have to be arbitrarily complex. So this is an arbitrary complex scalar. And now what I want to show is that Hilbert space is closed still under scalar multiplication. So if I multiply f, by a plus bi, I want to show that the integral from a to b of the magnitude squared of f times a plus bi is still in fact less than infinity and therefore still in Hilbert space. So let's write this out. First off, we can do distributive uh, and rewrite this. So f times a plus bi is actually just equal to f of x times a plus f of x times b times i, where a and b are just real constants. So in that case, uh, the magnitude squared of f times a plus b i is equal to the complex conjugate of this multiplied by this. So in that case, f star of x, and remember now a and b, I've split my complex number a plus bi into real components, a and b. So their complex conjugates are just themselves. So f star x times a plus f star x times b. Oh, but we have an i here. So we have to reverse the sign under complex conjugation. So this actually becomes minus f star of x times b times i. And then this is being multiplied by f of x times a plus f of x times bi. And now if we use distributive property, we see this is sort of analogous to a complex number being multiplied by its complex conjugate. Uh, if we multiply this out, we get f star f times a squared uh, plus f star f times a bi minus f star f times a b i and then finally uh, 
plus and minus make a minus, but the two i's make another minus, so plus f star f b squared. These two terms cancel out, so we're left with magnitude f squared e squared plus magnitude f squared b squared. If we then take the integral of this from our region of interest from a to b, then I can use distributive property and I get a squared plus b squared times the integral from a to b of the magnitude of f squared dx. And this is just equal to our constant c multiplied by a squared plus b squared. c is a finite number, a is a finite number, b is a finite number. This value is in fact less than infinity. Therefore, Hilbert space is also closed under scalar multiplication. Therefore, we have proved both of these conditions and we have solved part A. Hilbert space is in fact a valid vector space. Okay, part B is the same thing, uh, basically, but we're working with an inner product now and we're basically trying to show that this inner product definition does in fact satisfy the conditions for an inner product given in appendix A2. Uh, if we just look at these, right? Condition part one, the first condition, this one is obvious just by looking at it, right? Because if I have g f inner product star, this is the integral from a to b of g star f star dx, which just means the integral from a to b of g f star dx, which equals the integral from a to b of f star g dx, which is equal to the inner product of f and g. So first one is obvious. Uh, second one basically requires that uh, both functions are square integrable. So condition two basically requires that the integral of any square integrable function with itself is greater than or equal to zero. More so, it also says that if the inner product with itself is equal to zero. This is equivalent to saying that the actual function is in fact just equal to zero. So let's prove this. Uh, the first thing we have to recognize is that this inner product is defined as the integral from a to b of the magnitude of g squared dx. And the second thing we have to recognize is that an integral is simply just an infinite sum, right? An integral is just a sum, it's the same as a summation, but the indexes, the indices, instead of being integrals, or, or sorry, the, an integral is a summation with the difference being that the indices, instead of being discrete, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, are in fact continuous. So, you know, one, and then one point, zero, 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 an infinite number of zeros in the one, and then one point, zero, 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 so on, so on, so on, uncountably, uh, many, pretty much. So this, in reality, is just equal to a bunch of numbers adding together. You know, this is equal to like, you know, a plus b plus c plus blah, 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 an infinite number of sums, basically. And the individual sort of uh, terms in this sum are generated by your function g of x. So basically, you plug in a number for x, where x is basically your continuous index, and g of x will spit out a number that corresponds to a value in this infinite summation, effectively. So what this means is we can recognize that g is a complex function because it's in Hilbert space, as we defined earlier, which implies that it's going to spit out a complex number for any value that we put into this function. You know, given some x, g of x is a complex function and spits out a complex number. So what this implies is that the integral from a to b of g dx is going to give us an, a summation with a continuous index of g where every term in the summation is a complex number, a plus bi. Now, if we take the magnitude squared of g, 
Now all of a sudden, right, g originally gives you values under terms of a plus bi, but magnitude g squared is going to give you values of magnitude squared of a plus bi, and as we all know, for complex numbers, this is equal to a squared plus b squared. So what this tells you is that this integral is basically an infinite sum where every single term is of the form of one number squared plus another number squared. And automatically, because of the fact that, you know, square terms can always, always have to be either zero or positive, automatically we verify this condition, which is that the inner product of a function with itself in Hilbert space has to be zero or positive. If it's zero, the only way for it to be zero is if a and b are both zero, and for this to be the case for every single term in the summation. Because remember, the terms in this summation can never be negative because of the fact that these are squared. So the moment you have a non-zero term, instantly, you know, uh, the function itself is no longer zero, and also the integral itself is also no longer zero. So the only way for the inner product with itself to be zero is if every single term in this continuous summation is also zero, which means that a is zero and b is zero, aka for every value of x, g of x is equal to zero for all values of x. Which therefore implies that g of x is equal to zero. So as a result of that, if the inner product with itself is in fact equal to zero, then g is also just equal to zero. Now let's do condition three. So let's write out condition three. Condition three is telling us uh, where it wants us to work with the inner product of f of x with the quantity b times g of x plus c times y of x. Remember, f, g, and y are all in Hilbert space. Uh, and we want to show that this, in fact, gives you this solution. So let's actually expand this, right? So this is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x star, because remember this this is this whole thing is ultimately a uh, an inner product between f of x and then this vector or function. So since this is to the left of your inner product, it's always going to be a star. And then this is going to be just multiplied by b times g of x plus c times y of x in terms of function notation. In that case, we just use distributive property. This is an integral from a to b of f of x star times b times g of x plus f of x star times c times y of x dx, where b and c are just constants. Uh, let me expand my canvas a little bit. I get just 10,000. Okay, so at this point, I can split this into two integrals. Integral from a to b of f of x star times b times g of x dx, plus the integral from a to b of f of x star times c times y of x dx. Now, the next thing I can do is I can recognize that these are constants, so there's nothing stopping me from moving them outside of our integral, so therefore I move it out of our integral, this is just an inner product now, f, g. Same thing, I move the c out, the remainder is just an inner product between f and y. And just like that, we have proved property three, because if I look at this and compare it, I do in fact get the original result, uh, or I do in fact get the expected result. So therefore, we have proven all three of these conditions, and therefore this inner product definition does in fact match the three proposed conditions given in 8.2. And with that, we are done with the first problem of chapter three.